What a touching scene in today's gospel. We see him shedding human tears. This often, or a few times happened, and is recorded in the Holy Gospels when he shed tears. Another time was, of course, during his passion on the cross. And yet another was before he raised Lazarus from the dead. But today... He is walking near the beautiful city of Jerusalem with its golden temple and its rich stones and all of the people therein. And as he sat there on the hill overlooking this beautiful city in a single divine glance, he saw all that he would ever do and had ever done for that city and what its response would be. How he had walked the streets to preach them the doctrine of salvation. How he would very soon walk to Calvary and shed every last drop of his blood for their salvation and their response was to cast him outside the city walls and there put him to death. To treat him as a slave rather than a master, a God, a loving God at that. What more could I do that I have not already done? He seems to say to Jerusalem. But remember too that the city of Jerusalem in sacred scripture is also a symbol of the human soul. And so again, he weeps as he looks at each of our souls, perhaps, and he sees all that he has done for it, how he he has shed his blood and died on the cross for its salvation, had us baptized as a baby, perhaps, and our souls beautified as that temple in Jerusalem was once so beautiful. And yet we defile that temple. What more could I do, he says to the heavenly, the the human soul, that I have not already done? And yet how have you responded? And he weeps. Our Lord shed real tears on that occasion. And St. Augustine, the famous doctor of the church, he said that God had one son on earth without sin, but he never had one without suffering. And we pray it every day in the rosary that hail Holy Queen. What do we say? We say mourning and weeping in this veil of tears, for that is what it is. Nothing more than a veil of tears. And there is no escaping the fact that we will suffer, that we have suffered, and we are always going to suffer in this life. The question is not whether we are going to suffer. The question is, is how we ought to view suffering. And when I say suffering, I mean any types. I mean anxiety, worry, temptation, the trials that come between spouses and family members. I mean the effects of sin, injustice, lack of charity, All sorts, sickness, tiredness, all sorts of suffering, whether emotional, physical, spiritual. The answer to this question of how we are to view it is that we must put on the spectacles of faith. That is, that we must, we as humans, cannot see, our vision is blurred when it comes to viewing our sufferings. But when we put on the glasses 
those supernatural spectacles of faith were able to see everything clearly. What does our faith tell us about suffering? The first is that no one, no one, can attain eternal salvation without suffering. St. Paul once said to St. Timothy, and keep in mind when you read the the epistles to St. Timothy, he was by nature a very timid man, but through the grace of the Holy Ghost became filled with fortitude in preaching the faith. But St. Paul often had to, and you see it in his epistles to Timothy, had to chuff him up a little bit, encourage him to do the strong thing, despite what it might cost. And he said to Timothy, no one is crowned unless he strive lawfully. There is no victory without the race, without the struggle. There is no good work that we do that does not meet with some obstacle. How often have you seen that in your life? And there is no virtue that does not require a fight and a struggle. So when you pray for for a virtue, patience, for example, do not expect to be given the virtue without the fight, the opportunity to fight. Just because everything is going well one day and things aren't bothering you does not mean that you possess the virtue of patience. You know that you have the virtue of patience when inside you are you're burning with impatience and anger and yet you're able to prayerfully get through that temptation without any sign of impatience. Secondly, all suffering comes to us from God and is a sign of his love. We hear this all the time, and yet we forget it as often as we hear it. How many times I've heard, well, God must be angry with me because he sent me this cross. No, to be free of suffering is a bad sign. St. Augustine says that there is no greater misfortune than the good fortune of sinners. He who does not suffer now will have to suffer hereafter. All suffering comes from God and is perfectly arranged from all eternity. Thirdly, God never sends suffering which is beyond our strength. As it says in today's epistle, God is faithful who will not permit you to suffer above that which you are able. He may take you to the brinks of all of your strength, helped with grace, but he will never give you too much. It is we who imagine that we suffer too much and that the crosses God sends us are too heavy. But this is not a truth. This is rather a sign of faint heartedness, a lack of fortitude on our part. For in reality, even humanly speaking, man actually has more capacity to suffer then he has capacity for joy. Think of it. The joy of eating. You can only eat so much before it becomes pain. Same with every other joy. Soon enough, you've had enough. But pain, you think of someone with cancer, an awful, painful illness, And it just keeps coming and coming and coming. But that person always makes it through. In this sense, he thinks he's had enough. The pain becomes worse. 
and yet he's able to deal with that too. We have more capacity to suffer than we do to enjoy in this life. And furthermore, man has been known to be able to push himself to accomplish great feats. We think of many athletes. Look at what they do to attain their goal of being the best. They're never satisfied with the mediocre. They always push forward. The same with businessmen. A successful businessman always looks for new opportunity. He doesn't like the status quo. He's always moving forward. And so the grace of God will help us to keep moving forward. Fourthly, sufferings are sent to the sinner to bring about his conversion. Without suffering, think of how many saints we would be without. There would have never been a St. Ignatius if he had not been shot with a cannonball. If that cannonball did not penetrate the fortress and hit his leg, he never would have ended up on a sickbed and given the lives of the saints, which is what encouraged him that if these men can do it, so can I. I can become a saint. And when he, when he got better, he went and he entered religious life, and the rest is history. He is a great saint and the founder of the Jesuit order. Fulton Sheen says that sometimes the only way the Lord gets into some hearts is to break them. And so when you see a sinner suffering, realize that that is a grace of God. It is God knocking on that sinner's heart. Fifthly, the just, those who are striving for holiness, they too must suffer to prove whether or not they love God or creatures more. So, Suffering for the just man serves as a sort of penance. It cleanses us of all imperfection. It increases our zeal in the service of God. And it turns our souls to God. It forces us to our knees to pray to Almighty God. And the Catechism tells us that just as soap cleanses the body, so suffering cleanses the soul. So suffering is just that. It is soap for the soul. And sixthly, suffer, and lastly, sufferings are no real evil, but rather a benefit from God. St. Ignatius of Loyola said that when God sends us some great trouble, it is a sign that he designs great things for us and desires to raise us to great holiness. And so, what should our practical resolutions be? Because the faith is not meant to remain up here or in our hearts. It's meant to be practiced day in and day out. Well, as Job said, as it hath pleased the Lord, so it is done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Resolution number one. Resolve not to complain. This is no easy task, and you must keep recollected. That is, don't get too wrapped up in the business of the world. Meditate. Keep in union with our Lord and you will be able to catch yourself in moments of suffering and keep that resolution of not complaining. Another good resolution is when you feel like complaining, rather bless God. Say a glory be to the Father. That is a good prayer. That is to offer up your sufferings for the glory of the blessed Trinity. 
this type of resignation to suffering actually makes them easier to bear. We must be like soldiers in battle in the face of suffering. Think of the soldier. The battle is about to begin. What feelings come over his body? Panic. Worry. Wanting to run away to avoid this coming struggle. Aren't those the feelings that we get whenever suffering comes into our life? But what does a soldier do? He knows he can't run. So he becomes determined that I will stand my ground on this battlefield if it should kill me. For the glory of my country and for the good of the people therein. And so we are soldiers of Christ. And standing in the face of suffering, we must make ourselves determined that we are going to stand our ground. We're going to take that cross on our shoulder. And no matter how long of a journey we have to our Calvary, we will not lay that cross down. Because that cross will not only purify our souls from heaven, but it is our key to the gates of the heavenly kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.